Like many of you, I like dead media formats, tapes and discs and media cards that could have become ubiquitous but died on the vine instead. It's fascinating to think about what the world would be like if any of these had succeeded. What if HD DVD had taken off instead of Blu-ray? What if Video 8 had replaced VHS like it was supposed to? Oh yeah, that happened. Video 8, the format that was in a bunch of camcorders in the 80s and 90s, was actually supposed to be a home video format, as in home movies. This is Oliver Stone's JFK, released on two little tiny baby Video 8 cassettes. Sony wanted this to happen. They wanted you to go to the video rental store and rent these little tiny tapes instead of the big honking VHS tapes that we'd had since the mid 70s, which made a whole lot of sense. Your video collection would have been a lot smaller if it was on these instead of full-size VHS, but it just never happened. So there's a future that we're never gonna get to see, but boy, fascinating to think about what it would look like. This is one of the reasons I've always enjoyed watching Techmoan on YouTube. He's been a big inspiration to the way that I make my videos, but also he just has a massive stable of dead media formats, most of which I've never heard of. And with every one of them, it's the same thing. You think, what if these gigantic audio cassettes had caught on and we had those instead of CDs, right? What would your music shelves even look like? And one of those formats was DVHS, which should have caught on. It was a deck that recorded HD video onto VHS tapes, but it was released in 1998 and it didn't really go anywhere and it disappeared and no one ever got HD videotape as a result, but they should have. There never was a proper heir to VHS's throne. VHS was the common language of standard definition video. Everyone had a player and a recorder, and if you saw something on a TV, you could put that on VHS. Unless, of course, it was copy protected, but anyway. In the HD era, we never got anything like that. I mean, sure, you could get like a DVR or you could get a capture card for your PC, but that's not the same as just slamming in a tape, hitting record, and getting basically a hard copy of whatever you were watching instantly. DVHS could have inherited that legend, but sadly it didn't. Now, I don't have one of these decks. I've always kind of wanted one, but at the same time, I'm sort of bored by them because they are, after all, digital. I don't really care about digital. I mean, don't get me wrong, digital videotape was beneficial to everyone. Consumers got mini-DV, which made their camcorders smaller, higher quality, and easier to work with. They got Digital 8, which did the same thing, but on the existing 8mm cassettes. And they even got HDV, which in fact did let them record HD video onto these same mini-DV cassettes. Unfortunately, it came too late and got steamrolled by DVD and Blu-ray at pretty much the same time, but it was still a pretty good format. Professionals got even more and better stuff. DV Cam, DVC Pro, HD Cam, Digital Beta Cam, Beta Cam SX, all successful formats of one stripe or another. And in fact, some pros were using digital videotape all the way back in 1986 with the SMPTE D1 format. So digital videotape has a long, rich history, and I don't deny that it's been extremely useful, but it's just kind of boring. Sure, it's impressive as a technology if you really think about it, but Let's be honest, it's not usually that exciting to see something from the past do something you can do now the same way, unless it does a worse job of it. If I were to, for instance, figure out how to get a Pentium 3 computer hooked up to a 4K monitor, that might be interesting for a little bit, and then it would just become a computer with a 4K monitor. You probably have one of those. What is there to look at? Unless it did a bad job. If the image was all degraded and like messed up, that would be a lot more interesting and you could spend a lot longer looking at it and playing with it. The problem with old digital stuff is that it doesn't really do that. It doesn't usually degrade. When it's working, it's working perfectly. It might as well have been made last year. There's nothing really to look at. Now, almost every HD format that's ever existed has been digital, so all these complaints apply. There are a couple exceptions, like High Vision LaserDisc. Techmoan did a video on one of those, too, and you should go watch that, because I'm never going to be lucky enough to get one. Those High Vision LaserDisc systems are rare as unicorn horns. But there's another reason I'm not that interested in having one, which is that I can't put my own stuff on it. I just can't get any satisfaction from a system like that. Because if you can't record your own stuff, then all it is is a means to watch a handful of 90s movies. And if I wanted to do that, I'd just get them on Blu-ray. So imagine my excitement when I learned that there is a format out there that meets all my requirements. HD, analog, and recordable. In the early 90s, there was a format that could do all this on VHS tape.
This here is one of the decks that can do it. The format is called WVHS, the W standing for wide. JVC has a bunch of definitions for what that means. Uh, it's a wide aspect ratio. Uh, it's a worldwide standard. It'll have wide implications for videotape applications. All cute terms, but they really undersell it. It's not just about the video being wide, it's about it being full HD in 1993. Well, this one's a little later, it's from 95, but the specs are the same as the 93 version. This uses an internal resolution of 1125 lines, allowing it to record a 1035i or 1080i HD signal onto what sure looks like VHS, right? That 1125 number seems a little arbitrary, but it's actually the native resolution of the Japanese Muse system, which was actually broadcasting HD content in Japan in 1989, if you can believe that. 1125 lines was the base resolution of Muse, and this was originally designed to record the Muse system. In fact, the Japanese market version of this has Muse input jacks on the back that plug into a special decoder. And just to be clear, this is an interlaced format. So although it updates the screen 60 times a second, it's only storing about 562 lines with each update. But that's how broadcast HD works even now, so that's still pretty impressive. The machine itself is beautiful. It's a big beast, a little taller than most high-end VCRs ever were. It comes in the champagne finish. It's got gobs of inputs and controls, although most of them are typical of high-end VCRs of this era. It's equipped with all the controls you need for basic video editing, for instance. It has a jog and shuttle control. It lets you step frame by frame or move the video forward or back at variable speed. It can do audio dubbing. It has in-out index marks, all sorts of stuff that you saw on expensive VCRs of the era that almost nobody ever used but did technically make this practical for video editing. Editing. Besides those features, however, most of this is just like a normal VCR. The upper half of the rear panel is dominated by a typical collection of ports, S-Video and Composite in and out, and the majority of the controls are the old recognizable standards, play, pause, rewind, eject, the whole family. There's a few extra switches up here that let you do things like disable the remote for some reason, disable noise reduction to get the most accurate view during editing, and skew the YC timing, an incredibly specific tuning feature that only the biggest of dorks would have ever bothered with. It's also a perfectly capable standard definition SVHS deck. I've used it to watch some anime tapes from the 90s and it looks fantastic, like any other late model VHS deck that I've used. Here, this is one of my favorite demo tapes, Sewing with Nancy. Here on the PVM, you can see the video looks fine, just like you'd expect. As a VHS deck, the most appealing thing for me is the special playback capabilities. When it's paused, this deck gives a nice stable image, and using the jog and shuttle controls, I can carefully scrub through a tape and look at specific frames, which is a thing I often do with VHS tapes, but there are plenty of other decks that can do it. Let's see what made this one special. On the back, down here at the bottom, we have a row of new connectors, HD video in and out in component format, and then another output that looks suspiciously like a VGA connector. And back on the control panel, there's a light for HD and a button for HD input. You could miss these things. You could see this at a thrift store and just walk right by it, thinking it was just an ordinary SVHS deck. The few things that make it stand out are just these couple tiny labels and then this little marker on the front, all the way in the corner, that happens to say HDTV. You could walk right by this and never know how special it was. But of course that didn't happen. I knew what it was, so I got it, and now you know what it is, and we all want to see it go. So how should I do it? Should I um, get an LCD monitor and plug it into this thing that looks like a VGA port? Or maybe plug it into a scaler, hook it up to my OLED TV? That'll look great, right? Well, maybe, but it's not going to be very representative. I mean, I want to know what this was like when it was new. Well, I don't have a 1995 HDTV. I don't think anybody has a working one at this point. But I do know someone who can get us close. I'm on my way now to Portland to visit a friend who has an ideal television for demonstrating this VCR. Now, of course, I don't want to drive 192 miles just to see a TV, but for reasons that will become apparent, I can't bring it to where I am. I have to go to where it is. This is my friend Grant, and he's been slowly getting into old video technology himself. Uh, so what do you have right now? I have a collection of consumer CRTs ranging in size from tiny to large, and I also have a Laserdisc player and a collection of about 100 Laserdiscs. I also used to have a Sony BVM, which was a beautiful multi-scan broadcast video monitor, but it was 14 inches, which was a little bit too small for me to really use regularly. So I ended up selling it and I'm holding out to hopefully find a bigger one someday. But until you can find your dream BVM, uh, you have instead... A big Sony Vega TV. Why don't you show it to us? All right, this is it. Uh, this is the Sony KV30HS420. It's a 30 inch HD Trinitron CRT. Uh, my dad got it new in 2004, but he decided to upgrade and got rid of it 
and I couldn't bear to see it go to a landfill, so I took it into my own home. And how much does this weigh? It weighs 150 pounds. So you're telling me that you are a skeleton in a grave now? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I did die, and now I'm a revenant whose soul is trapped within this haunted television. So what exactly uh, do you do with this TV right now? Uh, right now, it's mostly living in the bedroom. I use it for watching movies at night, watching TV shows. I'll put on YouTube videos sometimes, that kind of thing. What's the oldest thing you've used on this TV? The oldest thing I've used on it is my PlayStation 3. We're going to go older. It's a 30-inch 16.9 HD 1080i CRT. There were actually a bunch of these made in the late 90s and 2000s by all different manufacturers, and the primary element they had in common was their incredible weight. Uh, I had to carry one of these up a flight of steps to an apartment once, so I can assure you many owners were crushed to death by them. Now, it's not quite contemporary to the VCR. It's about nine years newer. I couldn't get a 1995 HDTV. I've never even seen one in the flesh, and I'm sure if I did, it wouldn't work. This one, on the other hand, is recent enough that it's still working perfectly. It looks about as good as a plasma display. I mean, a 4K TV would steamroll it, but for what it is, it looks about as good as it possibly could, which means we're going to get the best possible quality when we demo our VCR through it. So this is really ideal. Besides the usual inputs, antenna, composite, S-video, etc., this set offers component HD and HDMI. Yeah, this is late enough that it's actually a CRT with HDMI input. Bet you've never seen one of those. In fact, at the moment, we are looking at a digital signal, the output from an Amazon Fire Stick connected via HDMI being displayed at a genuine native resolution of 1920 by 1080 although it is interlaced. The only mode I know for a fact this TV will do in true progressive scan is 480p. Everything else I'm aware of is interlaced. It might do some other modes, but I know for sure it won't do 1080p, although apparently that's not that big a deal. The Amazon stick doesn't seem to mind, and Grant tells me that even the PlayStation 5 will still output 1080i if you hook it up to this thing. So you can actually play brand new video games on this TV, which is a wild idea. I can't imagine what the latency situation is like, but that's still pretty cool. For comparison's sake, uh, here's the GameCube running at 480i and 480p, and it looks fantastic. I mean, come on, it's a late model, high-end Sony TV. Of course it looks great. We came here for analog HD, though, so let's take a look at that. Here we have a PlayStation 3 running at 1080i60 playing a Blu-ray. It's interlaced, but otherwise this is full HD video, folks. The real deal. It's using component cables to eke that last little bit of bandwidth out of analog transmission but it's streaming from a digital disc. It's time to go just that little bit further. We want to see HD from an analog source. The JVC can hook up over component just like the PS3, so we'll just move the cables over. And now we need media. So where does one get WVHS tapes? Well, I'm not convinced you ever really could. This thing had such a short lifespan that I don't know if any pre-recorded media ever made it into stores. I'm sure the deck came with some demo tape. That's probably the only thing anyone ever owned. Uh, but I haven't found evidence of any other WVHS media having been sold. In the press release when this originally came out in the US, JVC did say they were going to partner with a company that would in turn partner with KCTS, the Seattle PBS station, to release some of their programs on WVHS, but I haven't found any evidence that ever happened, can't find any news clippings, nothing like that. I actually emailed KCTS asking if they had any copies, but they haven't been able to find them so far. So I don't know if this ever really happened. I suspect that those demo tapes that came with the machine or were ordered from JVC directly are probably the only media that was ever available available other than blanks. Because after all, what was the original purpose of VHS? What was its crowning enduring achievement? It let people record their own tapes, and this machine is no different. It probably won't surprise you, however, to learn that this wants special tapes. If you put an ordinary VHS tape in there, it won't even switch to HD mode. The bandwidth requirements are so much higher that it does require a special formulation. Now, ideally, you would use the official WVHS media that JVC put out with the machine. Of course, that's few and far between these days, unsurprisingly. There are alternatives. Uh, JVC says you can use the media for their Digital S system, which was a line of professional camcorders that recorded MPEG digital video onto VHS-type cassettes. But I actually did get a tape for that system. This uh, DS34 says Digital S right there. And I tried it, but the quality wasn't what I thought it should be. And I later found out that it wasn't what it should be. So I'm not sure if I recommend these. Fortunately, however, recently, a bunch of actual WVHS cassettes showed up on eBay, so I grabbed several of them, but there are still some up there as of this recording. So if you have one of these machines, you should snatch some of these up as quickly as you can before they go away.
They look pretty different than an ordinary cassette. Almost every VHS I've ever seen looked like it came out of the exact same factory. It had the same two windows, the same texture, you name it. These ones, however, are gray instead of black. The window is a single narrow slit and the edges are all rounded off. They also offer extra protection for the tape. There's this little articulated cover that slides in underneath it when you close the flap, very similar to the design later used on Mini TV. There's also a sliding right protect switch instead of the break off tab that VHS uses. Otherwise, however, the tape itself looks no different and you'd probably still identify this as VHS from a distance. These were of course sold as blanks, but I have magically populated them with some demo footage. So let's pop this in and watch some analog HD VHS. To start, we're going to look at one of my favorite contemporary HD demos, Metamorphosis, a Sony production originally put out on High Vision Laserdisc in about 1990. I'm not going to include the audio here to avoid copyright issues, but I highly recommend you click the link in the description to view this video in its entirety. It's beautiful and the song is catchy. But it also already looks great on this format. I mean, we can definitely tell this isn't VHS. If it was, it would look more like this. So between the two, there's no contest, which comes as no surprise. It's not hard to outperform VHS, but this is doing more than that. It looks fantastic. It's colorful and detailed, and already it's a pleasure to watch. Next up, we have the Great America video, which probably a lot of you are familiar with because I think it was released for every early HD format, in particular DVHS. I think it came out on HD Laserdisc as well. Again, it looks great right off the bat, certainly better than it would on plain VHS, where it lacks considerable luster. But it doesn't just look okay, it looks fantastic. So far, WVHS is killing it. Next up, we have me. Who knew my stuff was available on obscure analog HD formats now? This is my recent video about handheld copiers, which is about 28 years newer than the last demo I showed you. I included this to give you an idea how the format performs with a modern input, just in case you have any doubts about the quality of HD cameras of 1995. Don't worry if you don't have a WVHS deck, I can do vanilla too. And once again, the comparison is laughable. The HD format certainly looks a lot nicer and honestly, totally watchable. I got this VCR almost three years ago and it took me nearly that long to find the media for it. And I spent all that time wondering when I find a tape and actually put HD content on it, is it going to impress me? Is it going to feel HD or is it going to feel dated? See, I'm somebody who remembers experiencing Blu-ray for the first time, seeing a movie in 1080p at 42 inches in my own home, being able to see the pores in the actors' faces was breathtaking. It was stunning. And I'm sure that in 1995, people had the same reaction to this format, but would I have that reaction now? Well, having finally done it, the answer is a resounding yes. It looks outstanding. It does not look like an early attempt at HD. It just looks like HD as we know it. And it looks even better, honestly, on an LCD display. The CRT introduces certain distortions to the image and it's got a certain amount of flicker to it as CRTs do. On an LCD, those elements are removed and it looks really staggeringly good. But even at the time, looking like this, it's perfect. We didn't need Blu-ray. If we'd just gotten this, people may not have ever wanted Blu-ray. Is it as good? No, no question. Is it good enough? Absolutely. If you were just watching a movie to watch it on this format now, you would be satisfied. And even if by pixel peeping we can determine that this isn't as good as Blu-ray, I don't think that really matters. For many, if not most people, the objective quality of a video format is not that important. But I think everyone does appreciate the really big leaps, the VHS to DVD to Blu-ray to UHD Blu-ray. These are massive improvements in quality that I think just about everyone appreciates. But beyond those massive order of magnitude differences, the details don't really matter. As long as something is 1080, I'm usually happy with it. And I think most people are like me. So while I can and will show you that this isn't as good as a digital HD version of a movie, I think by the standards of any era, this is still a great achievement. And hey, nobody was peeping pixels in 1995 anyway, because there weren't any computers to do it with at this resolution. But let's be mean and treat it like a modern format anyway. Let's begin with Metamorphosis. On the right side here is the footage I started with. On the left, a recording straight off the TV screen. Of course, it looks different right away because CRTs are very difficult to record, uh, and this one's nowhere close to color calibrated. Also, I have no idea what its actual effective resolution is like, so this isn't at all representative of what the tape is recording internally, but still, it's clear that it's rendering fine detail even on this screen. It's far and away better than VHS would ever look. 
For comparison, here's the video straight off the WVHS tape itself, output over component, and then re-digitized. This makes it pretty clear the resolution of the TV itself is a limiting factor. The actual images stored on the tape look stunningly clear, although they aren't quite perfect. The model's lashes are less well-defined, and the entire image has a slight horizontal smearing, most visible around the Sony logo in the corner. Great America also looks terrific, although the characteristic decrease in contrast that sort of carried over from VHS does hit a little harder in some places. Some scenes are admittedly just not as viscerally lush and impressive as the original video was. Other scenes come across fine, though, and they have all the color and detail and punch that this video was intended to have, especially if you look at the redigitized version. While the tape is altering the image, it's really not hitting it that hard. Looking at my video, on the other hand, is considerably more disappointing, and I'm not really sure why. While it is watchable, it feels like it has a tangible decrease in resolution. It just looks less detailed, kind of crummy, really, and I don't know why. Even the redigitized video doesn't look that hot to me. It's lacking a certain something I can't describe. It might just be that this video depends on parts of the color space that this format can't render that well, or some other phenomenon I don't really know. Finally, I tried transferring a few minutes of some recent movies from Blu-ray, one live action, one animated. I don't have the original footage to compare to here, so terrific Blu-ray is a pain, but here's the TV screen and the redigitized video, at least. The media I've been showing you so far was meant to be stared at and scrutinized, pixel-peeping fodder before we'd even coined that term, but these aren't that. They're just ordinary, imperfect media that you're meant to sit back and enjoy, not pick apart. This is, after all, what we're supposed to be doing with this technology. I didn't exactly choose the best demo scenes from John Wick 3, these ones are pretty dark, but I remember having trouble with VHS movies back in the day because I couldn't see all the detail in the dark area, so that seems like less of a problem here. When watching an ordinary movie, the quality of the tape seems basically perfect. If I pause it, it looks pretty rough, but in motion it's just fine. Legend of Korra is, of course, the exact opposite of John Wick with its intense bright colors. Other test footage made me think this format had trouble with large areas of flat color, but cell shading seems to hold up just fine. Animated movies always got the long end of the stick with videotape anyway, but I'm still impressed at how good this looks. None of my recordings do this justice, but in person, both these movies look like they're playing from Blu-ray. For one extra perspective, here's some of this footage direct out of the VCR, but displayed on a much newer monitor. See that port that looks like a VGA on the back of the deck really is VGA. JVC included it because high-resolution computer monitors were far more obtainable than HD televisions in 1995 and at much more reasonable prices. A modern LCD will work just fine on this deck, and the picture looks almost like the redigitized version from before. The output circuitry on this VCR is definitely the best JVC could manage, although I'm not sure it comes across in the recording here. I think that while these perspectives show that WVHS is not comparable to a digital format, it is closer than you'd expect, and it does seem likely that it outperformed any display technology that was available when it hit the market. The TV definitely seems like the limiting factor here. So I'd say that based on all these perspectives, this looks just about like what you'd expect analog HD to look like. I mean, it could have either looked terrible or it could have looked like this but it couldn't have looked a whole lot better. There is some degradation. There's a kind of horizontal streaking you can see, particularly on areas of solid color, and the contrast and color have kind of limited gamuts, much like you see with VHS. It really looks very much like VHS that's HD, or at least SVHS that's HD. It couldn't really be described better. It feels exactly like it should. Much like with VHS, while these problems are there, they're not particularly arresting. I mean, we watched millions and millions of movies on VHS and we're always happy with it. This is much the same. It's not perfect, but it's certainly good enough. However, there is one quality, one form of degradation that actually is noticeable and seems to be a quality of the format, and I don't quite know what's causing it. If we zoom in and slow down the image and take a close look, moving objects often have a sort of shimmering after image following them, kind of like Alucard's cloak in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I think this is an intrinsic quality of the medium, and I have some theories about why that is, but I'm concerned it could be an effect of my production chain, and now would probably be a good time to tell you how I got the video onto these tapes. I could pick apart these images as much as I want, but it's not truly going to tell us how good this thing is because these aren't commercially produced media. If somebody wants to send me a tape like that, I'll be happy to rip it, but I can't get a hold of any right now, so I had to figure out my own method for getting media onto these tapes, and it's not the cleanest process. 
I did this by playing video on a laptop connected to an HDMI scaler, which converted it into 1080i60 component video, which I fed into the VCR. And to get the ripped footage, I then fed the component output of the VCR back into the scaler and captured it via HDMI again. So this footage hasn't been analog for a very long time, and this is at least a third generation conversion since I got these videos off of YouTube for the most part. So we're nowhere close to the true limits of the medium. However, in my defense, the DVD-O VP30 is a very good scaler, and the raw output fed into a monitor looks nearly indistinguishable from HDMI. I can't see the trails if I connect the VP30 straight into a monitor, and I think I can see them if I play back the WVHS into that same monitor. So I'm pretty sure this is something the deck is doing, not the scaler. It would still be nice though to test with some video that hasn't been through so many conversions. So I brought along my Sony Professional Disc camcorder, which is digital through and through, but it does output 1035i HD video over analog component. So let's see how that looks. If this looks anything like my previous tests, it looks pretty good. Mostly it's in the same ballpark and it's not a whole lot better than the raw digital footage that this camera is capturing, which is this right here. Now to be clear, this is not proper full HD 1920 by 1080. It's only about 1440 by 1035. So while this isn't necessarily the best test either, the point is that most of the things I could put into this tape come out looking much like they did when they went in, which is really all you can ask for. I think at the end, these demos are fairly representative of what this format can do. I think I've been fair to it and it's passed with flying colors. And even if it didn't look impressive by our modern standards, it's still undeniably super cool. I mean, it's HD video on analog tape. How can that not be rad? Of course, it's hard to show you how impressive it actually is. It seems to just work. The tapes just look like tapes and you can't see the clever way the information's being stored on them. Of course, I don't really understand how the information is being stored on them. JVC never really published any information about how this stuff works. I don't think it was out there long enough for that kind of pamphlet to make the rounds. So if it was ever out there, nobody seems to have it. In fact, the only way I could find any concrete information on how WVHS works internally was by buying a service manual for a previous model. Now it does contain a lot of information to be sure, but a lot of it's inscrutable and there's diagrams throughout that just look like mysticism and runes. But I think after studying it for a couple days, I've got the basics down. So I'm gonna say goodbye to my friend, take you home and explain how I think this thing functions. <sighs> this thing is really an achievement, but how do they do it? Well, they could have just run the tape faster, faster tape, higher bandwidth, that would solve the problem, but it sort of flies in the face of VHS's legacy. It's fairly well accepted that VHS won the format wars in the first place by having the longer run time, three to four hours in its very first release. According to legend, this meant you could record an average baseball game on it, and that was the target that JVC aimed for. I can't imagine them backing off from that with WVHS, and indeed they didn't. The longest runtime you could get at the initial release of the format was three hours, so not quite as long as VHS, but still, they can't be running the tape much faster than VHS. They wouldn't get anywhere close to that. There must be some kind of trickery afoot. JVC's brochure for this deck says that it uses time compression integration to store component luminance and color signals offset by time in alternating parts of the video track. That didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at first, so I had to go get the service manual, and once I read that, I sort of understood it, but not really. I had to go back and refresh myself on the basics of how recording component video on tape could work at all. At its core, an analog TV signal in the US began its life as three separate components. You had the luma, also called luminance or Y, which represents how bright each point in the image is. Then when we added color to the system, we introduced two other signals called PD and PR. These represent the difference between the luminance and the blue and red components of each point in the image. And together, these are referred to as the chrominance signals or chroma. Ideally, we would always have stored and transmitted these signals as all three separate components, but since that requires three times as much bandwidth, we've never done it that way. Instead, TV broadcasts always combine all three signals into a single signal, and then the TV that's receiving that can pull it apart and try to reproduce the original components. It never does it perfectly, but hey, it's good enough, right? That signal, before being broadcast, or after being demodulated, or when being sent around between your VCR and your TV, is referred to colloquially as a composite signal. Consumer equipment only used composite for decades. There wasn't much point in offering anything better because whatever you were receiving or whatever you were storing only spoke composite. So if you transmitted it around as component, it was just gonna get smashed back together at the other end. 
Eventually, when consumers started buying equipment that could produce a higher quality signal, we started getting component interconnects on TVs, DVD players, and that sort of thing. But that was well into the 90s. For decades prior, however, professionals had needed to transmit signals around at higher quality, so they wouldn't have degradation as they were moving them around the studio or in between editing decks. And in fact, those editing decks needed to be able to save that component signal intact. If they just smashed it down to composite when they were putting it on the videotape, again, that wouldn't have done anybody any good. So the professional market had component videotape as early as 1982 with Sony's Betacam format. There might have been other pro component formats, but the one I'm familiar with is Betacam. This is Betacam. It looks pretty much identical to Betamax, but where Betamax stores a composite signal, this stores a component one. And if you've been paying close attention, you might be starting to think that that seems like a really hard thing to do on a tape. Videotape stores video as a series of parallel diagonal strips of magnetic flux. In a VHS machine, for instance, each one of these strips contains one screen full of video information. It's completely self-contained. As the head sweeps across it, it fills the entire screen with an image. This works because it's composite video, so all the info you need could be stored in one track. But for component, wouldn't you need to store three tracks? That seems really mechanically hard. You'd have to store one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and then one, two, three. The head would have to either read three tracks at once or come around three times to read one screen full of video. That seems really awkward. And sure enough, Betacam doesn't store the video on three separate tracks, but it does store it on two. The drum has two heads at two different heights, and every time it comes around, it reads two tracks simultaneously. Now that's pretty wild, but it's still only two. Where do we get the third? Well, that's where things get wacky. One track stores the Illuma component, like you'd expect, while the other track stores both Chroma components, but not mixed together. They're stored separately in their entirety, using a technique that Sony calls compressed time division multiplexing. The idea is that while the Illuma is being recorded normally, the two Chroma signals are time compressed, so that they move twice as fast. Then one can be written, followed by the other on the same track, in the same distance as the Luma signal. That way you've got all three in the same place, and you can read all three of them simultaneously while only using two tracks. Of course, now the signals aren't being recorded at the same time, which seems like a tough nut to crack. The solution is like this. During playback, as the head reads both tracks, the Luma signal is being fed into an analog delay line, essentially an extremely long piece of wire that takes a long time for a signal to travel through. So while the Luma signal is circulating through that wire, the head could pick up the chroma, PB, and PR, feed them into their own delay lines, and this is all carefully choreographed so that they all exit at the exact same moment and can then be reintegrated. How do they undo the time compression? Good question, I have no idea. This was all done with analog components in 1982, and it's a complete mystery to me how they pulled it off. Now, the name of this process, compressed time division multiplexing, sounds awful close to JVC's time compression integration, and they do have some things in common. They're taking a similar approach to the problem, but JVC's is considerably different. It's also very complicated, and I don't think I really understand how it works. So take this as more of an overview than an actual technical explanation. The JVC system also uses two parallel tracks. If you look very closely at the video drum in the WVHS VCR, you can see the two heads side by side. They look like they're at the same level, but I believe they really are separated just a tiny bit vertically. The components are split across the tracks, but differently than Betacam. The Luma signal is interlaced again, and half the lines are put on the first track with the other half on the second track. Then once the Luma is done, the PB and PR are both written right behind it. So this is very similar to Betacam, just sort of rotated 90 degrees. JVC says they did this so that the Chroma and Luma would never have to be next to each other on the tape. Now, it's odd that they needed to do this and Sony didn't, but I'm guessing it's because the resolution and the bandwidth of WVHS is so much higher than standard def that they ran into crosstalk issues that Sony didn't have to deal with with Betacam. But it is the same basic idea in the end. You take the three components and store them on two tracks by storing them in time sequential fashion and then reintegrating them in circuitry. However, for whatever reason, maybe just because technology had gotten better or maybe because it was difficult to do this all in the analog domain, JVC does not do this with time delay circuits. They do it all in a computer. Every WVHS deck that JVC produced reads the signal in, stuffs it into a computer, does a whole bunch of processing to it, and then reconstitutes an analog image to spit out the back. So you can never really see what's truly on the tape. 
Unlike a 1970s VCR, where the signal that comes out the composite jack is basically what's on the tape put through an amplifier, the output from this is pretty much just a computer graphics card. The component signal is generated from a digital bitmap and a frame buffer. That's probably why JVC put a VGA port on it, because converting from a bitmap and a frame buffer to RGB is no harder than converting it to component. You're changing it into a completely different format anyway. This is also where I suspect the motion artifacts I mentioned earlier are coming from. The algorithms in this thing are probably pretty complex, and they apparently apply a whole bunch of things called emphasis, a term I don't really understand, but among them is something called temporal emphasis, which appears to use the data from one frame to do something to the next frame. Also, this format was based on the Japanese Muse system, and if you read about that, it also uses something called time compression integration, although from what I could tell, it seems a little different than the JVC approach. But but it also uses something called vector motion compensation, which I think sounds very much like the motion prediction that's built into digital compression codecs, and I suspect there's a similar thing going on here. So maybe this inherited the motion artifacts from Muse. The heavily computerized nature of this thing is probably also responsible for the very strange things that happen when the signal isn't what it expects. I'll warn you that there's going to be some flashing lights on screen in a moment here, because sometimes when the head runs off the end of the recorded signal and into nothing, it starts blasting these colored rectangles onto the screen at blinding speed. I don't know what it could be doing. I mean, it should be reading either nothing or maybe static, but for some reason it's coming up with these geometric shapes, and I don't have any explanation for it, except that the algorithms in this thing are so sophisticated that they're essentially doing like an AI deep dream thing and seeing what they think are shapes where there aren't any. Likewise, sometimes when I pause, I get a nice clear freeze frame, and sometimes I get these weird corrupted images with disjointed portions, or they've got color streaks through them or whatever, and I don't really know what could be causing this. There are plenty of other things I don't know about this machine, uh, like why doesn't it convert between formats? If you put in an HD VHS, it will not output it through the composite jacks. If you put in an ordinary VHS, it won't output it through the HD jacks. I know scaling video is hard, but even in 1995, I I'm pretty sure that should be practical. If everything's being fed into a frame buffer, they should be able to line double or line discard as needed to scale up and down. Now, one explanation is that in 1995, this was just harder or produced a lower quality image than I think. But another possible explanation is that the VHS and WVHS components of this machine have nothing to do with each other. Maybe there's a WVHS deck in here and a VHS deck, and they hardly touch each other except for sharing a few components. Maybe the frame buffer is never used for VHS, and maybe the WVHS side doesn't have a composite video output at all. This sort of existential question about the spirit of the machine really brings us to another more important question. Is this video clickbait? Is this really an HD VHS recorder? Can we call it that in good faith? Think about it. It won't even try to record HD on a normal tape and the tapes that it does want won't fit into a normal VCR. So if I can't put this into a VHS machine, in what way is it VHS? Other than the shell being superficially similar, you know, the spindles and the tape are in the same place, there's really nothing VHS about this. So probably a better way to think of this machine is a bespoke format that happens to use a VHS compatible shell so that it can be built into a hybrid player that supports both this brand new unrelated format and a legacy format so that people might actually buy it. Every attempt to replace VHS pretty much failed, I think, because people were unwilling to get rid of their VCRs. If JVC had approached the market and said, hey, we've got this cool new HD format, but you have to buy a deck this size that won't play VHS, nobody would have bought a single one because no one was willing to have this sitting next to their VCR. So instead, I think JVC took the very wise decision of putting this format inside of a mechanically compatible shell so that they could just build a VHS deck into the same chassis. So people would just be able to buy one unit and play both formats in it. So it's not VHS, and it's hard to even really call it analog. I mean, sure, the signal being stored on the tape, as far as I could tell, does use varying levels of magnetic flux, not just two. So you can't call it digital for sure, but it doesn't act very analog. The machine is very digital, and it treats the signal on the tape as sort of a temporarily embarrassed digital signal. 
Everything about this is algorithms and frame buffers and bitmaps, and it's only analog where it absolutely has to be. It's still cool though. I mean, this is one of those technologies that was created at incredible expense in order to fill a gap that the company thought would only exist for a very short period. JVC probably thought that HD was going to arrive by the mid 90s and that by the time the market was really ready to buy these things, they would have replaced them with much more advanced technology that would become available by that time. They just wanted to get this to market so that they could be first to market. So their name could be out there so people would think of them as the HD people. Instead, the HD transition came way later than anyone expected. We knew HD was coming by the end of the 80s, and by the mid-90s, manufacturers, broadcasters, studios all thought that we would have it by like 1999. And instead, due to a comedy of errors, it didn't actually happen until the mid-2000s, and most homes didn't actually have an HDTV at all until the end of the 2000s. Nobody could have predicted this. Meanwhile, digital technology progressed way faster than anyone could have expected. While digital compression at the beginning of the 90s was limited to things like MPEG, which is pretty sad, by the mid-90s we had DV, which is pretty efficient, and by the end of the 90s we had MPEG-2, which was very efficient and could be purchased in inexpensive hardware implementations. Suddenly, digital video became far more feasible. This thing looked ridiculous, and JVC very rapidly recycled the idea to make DVHS. In fact, they even sold a DVHS player in the exact same chassis as this. It really is what this machine wanted to be, but couldn't be in 1995. If either of these formats should have taken off, DVHS would have been the preferable one, of course. But even by the time it came out in 1998, there was still not really anything to put on it. And by the time there was HD video to record, consumers had already gotten addicted to the non-recordable media, like DVD, and they were ready to just walk away from home recording forever, which is what they did. But if there had been HD video in 93, if JVC had convinced people to buy these, and then there'd been something to record onto them, they would have proliferated like wildfire, and no one would have given it up, much like they refused to give up VHS well into the DVD era. Even if it was worse in many regards, it would have at least been much more democratic. And hey, I don't know if it's supposed to be like this, but I couldn't find any copy protection on here. I was able to rip movies off of Blu-ray with this thing, which you're not supposed to be able to do. Honestly, while this machine is beautiful and quite an accomplishment, I don't know if it was ever going to be a serious product. It's a shame that the swan song of analog video, such as it is, had to die like this in a forgotten format that nobody ever bought. If anybody out there has any media for this thing uh, that you'd like to send to me to rip, I would love to do that. Anything I can do to remember the last moments of analog video in the consumer market, I would love to do. But I don't think I'm going to get any bites. I think this thing just never happened. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please subscribe. Let me know you like this sort of thing. Uh, remember to turn on notifications because I upload kind of regularly. If you really like this video, consider supporting me on Patreon. These are some of the people that are doing that right now, and I'm really grateful for their help because I can't afford this sort of thing otherwise. Buying the machine, the tapes, and so on costs quite a bit of money. So I'm grateful to all of them and everybody else who's supporting me, and I'm grateful to everybody else for watching this video. Thank you.